All right, everybody. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, of course. And uh, tonight we start kind of a new chapter of the Dharma Doors. We're going to do a new sutra. Uh, and so let me introduce sort of what we're going to be doing on Sunday nights for a while. So what I want to do is I've decided that I'd like to return to the classics. And so what that means is, is that we're going to, rather than doing the Mahayana Bodhisattva Sutras that we've been working on now for a while, actually kind of a couple of years, we're going to shift gears and we're going to go back to well, I mean, as far as what we're going to be reading, yeah, we're going to be going back to the Pali canon. And so we're going to be reading from the Nikayas, the collection of the early teachings of the Buddha. And if you were there or if you've watched it online, I was up in San Francisco last week and we did a workshop where we spent the whole afternoon uh, reading and studying one sutra from this collection. And so I decided, let's stick with the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. I decided, yeah, let's, let's stick with this collection for a while. And so what we're going to be doing is, is that every Sunday night, we're going to look at a different sutra, or sutta, as it's called. Um, and actually, the suttas or the sutras in the Samyutta Nikaya, they tend to be on the short side. So that allows us to sort of cover a whole sutra in a, in a night. And yeah, and this will sort of allow for more people to just sort of drop in on any given Sunday night. I know before, we would kind of be spending a lot of time with a particular sutra in it. It, it might have put a few people off in terms of not encouraging them to join in midway. So that's what we're going to do. And so the sutra that we're going to look at tonight is called the Achella Kashapya Sutra, or in Pali, the Achella Kasapa Sutta. This is uh, trans. Yeah, and there's a link in the chat for an English version of the sutra. It's not exactly the, the version I'm going to be reading tonight. I'm going to read from this translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi, the wisdom publication. There's not a lot of difference, I have to say, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> um, yeah, let's start. So the sutta that we're going to be doing is it's in the same section as the sutra that I did last weekend up in San Francisco. So we are in what is called the uh, Nidana Samyutta. So the Connected Discourses on Causation. If you happen to have the big blue book, we I'm on page 545. This is called the naked ascetic kasapa, and that's what the, the term achella means. Ah, chela, no chela, no clothing, no clothing kashapya is what they used to call him. Um, actually, I, I have a few things to say about that. So, yeah. So let's let's dive in. Let me just, I'm going to begin, and I'm not going to read the whole sutra to begin. I thought I might, but then I realized it's a little long. So let's do it in chunks. I'm going to start with just reading the opening, and that'll kind of set the stage and give us a few things to think about. So here you go. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One, the Buddha, was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel, the squirrel sanctuary. Then in the morning, 
the Blessed One dressed and, taking bowl and robe, entered Rajagaha for alms. The naked ascetic, Kasapa, saw the Blessed One coming in the distance. Having seen him, he approached the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he stood to one side and said to the Buddha, we would like to ask Master Gotama about a certain point, if you would grant us the favor of answering our question. The Buddha replied, this is not the right time for a question, Kashapya. We have entered among the houses. A second time and a third time, the naked ascetic Kashapya said to the Blessed One, we would like to ask Master Gotama about a certain point, if he would grant us the favor of answering our question. This is not the right time for a question, Kashapya. We have entered among the houses. Then the naked ascetic Kashapya said to the Blessed One, we do not wish to ask Master Gotama very much. Then ask what you want, Kashapya. <laughs> so before we even hear Kashapya's question, let's kind of just mention a few things and then we'll get into the questions. But I want to have I want to um I want to paint a picture in your mind, so to speak, so we can kind of appreciate the exchange here. So although the name Kasapa or Kashapya, as it is in the Sanskrit, although this name is pretty common and we hear it a lot, this is not the Kashapya that we would be used to hearing about. This is a particular person named Kashapya who was known as the Achela Kashapya, the, the naked ascetic. And I just wanted to share with you really quickly, because I've never, I don't think I've really mentioned this before, but it has to do with sort of the, the milieu of the Buddha or the environment, the cultural environment of the Buddha. And so what you should know or something to consider about like the time of the Buddha, at the time of the Buddha, there were a lot of yogis, ascetics, wanderers, seers, rishis, they go by a lot of different names. In fact, another name that they go by is a sadhu. This is a very beautiful, interesting book about sadhus. So these are not Buddhists. These are kind of the, this is contemporary, of course. This is like modern day India. But what's interesting about it is that you see or you'll find somebody like this. So this is not a Buddhist. This is a, an ascetic. And you'll, you might have noticed he was naked in that sense. And there's actually a lot of these particular kind of ascetics. See if I can find another... Well, my point is, so here's another kind of person who would go around basically nude, although he does have like accoutrements in that way, he's naked. And that of course is a little different than say, oops, sorry. This is a little different, say, than somebody, uh, an ascetic like this person, who is kind of taking on the role of almost a god, looking like Shiva with his Shiva trident and things like that. So the naked ascetic is like a particular group of a kind of wanderer. And I just kind of want you to kind of know or consider that at the beginning of this sutra, the naked ascetic Kashapya is not a Buddhist. He's doing his own thing, but he's come to ask the Buddha a question. And spoiler alert, 
Kashyapya is going to be very influenced by the Buddha's answer and is basically at the end of the sutra, it will kind of convert to Buddhism. So I just kind of want you to kind of know that this is a story about sort of taking one of these wandering ascetics from a different kind of tradition. And this is a story about them coming over to the Buddhist tradition in that way. Um, also, just a quick note, not a, not a lot of sutras take place in the squirrel sanctuary, but I have discovered that some of my favorite sutras come, or they were all given in the squirrel sanctuary. So as we proceed forward in the Dharma doors, let's, uh, maybe the squirrel sanctuary will become a theme that we'll pick up on. So, all right. Let's get to Kashapya's question. So he's 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 bothered the Buddha. They're in public, basically. They're wandering around begging for food. And he's like, it's not the right time. We're supposed to go back. We're supposed to eat our food. Then we talk. But Kashapya can't wait. And he said, look, I don't have a lot to ask. So the Buddha says, okay, fine. Then ask what you want, Kashapya. And here's the, the line of questioning. How is it, Master Gautama? Is suffering created by oneself? Not so, Kashapya, the Blessed One said. Oh, then Master Gautama. Is suffering created by another? Not so, Kashapya, the Blessed One said. How is it then, Master Gautama? Is suffering created both by oneself and another? Not so, Kashapya, the Blessed One said. Then, Master Gautama, has suffering arisen fortuitously, being created neither by oneself nor by another? Not so, Kashapya, the Blessed One said. How is it then, Master Gautama? Is there no suffering? It is not that there is no suffering, Kashapya. There is suffering. Then is it that Master Gautama does not know and does not see suffering? It is not that I do not know and do not see suffering, Kashapya. I know suffering. I see suffering. Then Kashapya says, whether you are asked, how is it Master Gautama is suffering created by oneself? Or is it created by another? Or is it created by both? Or is it created by neither? In each case, you say, not so, Kashapya. When you are asked, how is it then, Master Gautama? Is there no suffering? You say, it is not that there is no suffering. Kashapya, there is suffering. When asked, then is it that Master Gautama does not know and not see suffering? You say, it is not that I do not know and see suffering, Kashapya. I know suffering. I see suffering. Venerable sir, let the Blessed One explain suffering to me. Let the Blessed One teach me about suffering. Okay. So, before we hear the answer... I thought tonight, it's sort of actually one of the reasons why I chose to do this sutra. There's, there's a few reasons why I wanted to talk about this sutra, but I wanted to start with, we haven't done it for a while. I feel like we haven't talked about it for a while. So I wanted to take a moment to talk about dukkha, suffering, this word suffering. So the... If you're reading the version online that we gave you a link, this is the version that's translated by Thanissaro Bhikkhu, you might notice they, this Bhikkhu, 
chooses to translate dukkha, dukkha, chooses to translate it as, well, I see actually that they're going between two translations. Interesting. In some instances, it seems that they are translating it as stress. And then in other moments, they are translating it as pain. I have also, of course, seen the term translated as anxiety, as angst, as, of course, suffering. So what is it? So we know, or I hope you all know, you know, that the, the term, the particular word that we're talking about is dukkha or dukkha. Unsatisfactoriness is another um, translation in that way. And here's the thing about translation. So a lot of you know, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you know, I'm a translator. I think about translation a lot. It's something kind of that just as a project, like the idea of translating is very interesting to me. And so you take a word like dukkha, and whenever you're translating, of course, you have this sort of, this issue. Well, there's, there's an easy way, but it's, it's not the best way. And that's to not translate it at all, <laughs> just to use the word dukkha. <laughs> But that doesn't get us very far if we don't kind of know what it means. So let's hold on to that as a possibility. Then we kind of have two other options. We could kind of look at the word dukkha etymologically, like look at it in the Pali language or look at it in Sanskrit, look at its parts, the du and the kaha, and really kind of look at those and get, you know, kind of, again, etymological, and then try to find a word in English that means the same thing etymologically. That is one option. From what I understand, the word dukkha indicates a sort of um, disjointedness, a sort of being out of sync, out of phase, a kind of things being disjointed. So let's say for now that the word dukkha literally means like disjointed. And then that would be an English translation, right? But would, would disjointedness really get us there? Would that really kind of make us feel what the Buddha wants us to understand? Maybe, maybe not in that sense. You know, so is disjointedness caused by the self or by oneself? Is disjointedness caused by another? I don't even know what we'd, we were, would be talking about at that point. <laughs> it, so for me, that kind of more literal etymological approach, while it, it seems nice, it might not actually play out in the long run. So then what we're looking at is a more what might be called kind of a hermeneutical approach to the problem. And hermeneutics is an interesting kind of subdivision of language study where it's about usage. So it's about how the word is used. What does the Buddha use the word dukkha to refer to? So not what does it mean literally etymologically, but like how is it used? And that's where we actually come to a very kind of clear presentation by the Buddha of what is meant by dukkha. You can find it all over the place, but you could also look at the very, very first sutra, the, the Buddha's very first teaching, in which he makes it clear, like, oh, dukkha, what I'm talking about? <sighs> Birth, death, loss, suffering, pain, grief, lament take your pick. So at that point, we sort of need to take a step back and be like, oh, okay, so the Buddha is talking about using this word dukkha to refer to a whole world of ideas. And then at that point, we would need to then reconsider 
translating it as, say, stress. Now, I'm all for upaya. Many of you know, like, I'm all for, like, teaching dharma upayakli. And what that means is, if it's going to be expedient to translate dukkha as stress, because it's going to sort of, you know, resonate with somebody, and because we have stress, and if they hear that the dharma, if they hear that about Buddhism is about ridding oneself of stress, and somebody has stress, that's going to sound pretty good. And I would want that person to know, yes, the dharma alleviates stress. That's kind of part, part of what it's in the business of doing. However, if we look at the descriptions of dukkha, <laughs> so one second on that, Renata. Um, if we look at the uses of dukkha, we have to kind of acknowledge that one of like the big aspects of dukkha, many, again, there are many, but one of them is about grief. And what I mean is, is that we're talking about like the suffering of losing a loved one. I would not describe that as stressful. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's stressful, but I would put grieving for the loss of a loved one as something a little different than just stress or anxiety. But again, not to say that dukkha doesn't include stress or anxiety, but it also includes sort of like really intense emotions like that loss, the like big loss in that way, terror is a part of dukkha, being terrorized, being absolutely devastated. All of those are dukkha in that sense. So that's sort of one of the ideas that, or one thing that I want to talk about tonight is what exactly does, the what are they talking about in terms of causing this oneself or causing it by another? So questions, comments, answers, ideas about Dukkha before we go forward, because I'd love everybody to be sort of on the same page before we hear the Buddha's answer to all of this. Everybody feeling okay about that definition? And like, so again, I'm not dismissing it as stress, but I don't want it to be limited to just that idea. I would like it to be the whole all-inclusive. So now... Let me kind of reframe, not reframe, but let me restate the question. So Kashapya is coming at this with the question of, is suffering created by oneself? Or is suffering created by another? And upon, when we first look at this, when we first read this, we might be thinking that they're talking about like, am I causing myself the stress and the grief and the terror? Or is it something other than me causing the grief and the terror? That is kind of what is being asked, but there's actually something a little more subtle going on. And I think it's going to yeah, it's going to come out in the Buddha's answer. So is everybody ready to hear? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So once again, let the Blessed One explain suffering to me. Let the Blessed One teach me about suffering. So at the bottom of page 546, if you have the big book, the Buddha says, Kishapya. If one thinks the one who acts is the same as the one who experiences the result, then one asserts with reference to one existing from the beginning, suffering is created by oneself. When one asserts thus, 
This amounts to eternalism. But Kashapya, if one thinks the one who acts is one person, the one who experiences the result is another person, then one asserts with reference to one stricken by a feeling, suffering is created by another. When one asserts thus, this amounts to annihilationism. Without veering towards these two extremes, the Tathagata teaches the Dharma by the middle. And then we have the listing of the 12 links of the chain of dependent origination, which we'll talk about in a second. But I want to clarify the Buddha's answer because, again, it, it, got, it gets a little tricky there. So it would seem from the Buddha's answer that we are not talking about suffering being caused by a, 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 like a, a stranger or being caused by something else. What they're actually talking about is, and it's in the Buddha's language there, it's this relationship about the performer of an action and then the, the one who receives the result of the performance of that action. And the question that they're kind of debating or wondering about is, are these the same people? And this is a little, you know, this is a tricky question in that way. So let's see. And then we have this idea, just to, just to, to round this out, we also have this idea that suffering just sort of comes out of nowhere. <laughs> this, the, the option, what did they call it? The idea of it just being fortuitous, that it's just like, it's not from the self or from the other. It's just something that happens in that way. Buddhism is definitely not going to be convinced about that idea in that way. And so really what we want to be talking about are these two options which the Buddha says these two options fall into the extreme views of, again, eternalism or annihilationism. And let's remember that annihilationism is what we in the modern kind of world would call nihilism in that way. So just for clarity's sake, because I do see, you know, there's a kind of a number of what to me are new people. So let's kind of clarify these two extreme views in that way. So just really quickly, there's this idea. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's a question. And the question is, and it's tricky because there's already this presumption that we are talking about a kind of a true you in a way. And when I say the true you, you know, I'm talking about what we think of as our real self. And what I mean by that is, you know, I have this uh, gray beard now, but I, I didn't always have a gray beard, right? I actually, I used to not even be able to grow a beard. And then I could grow a brown beard and now it's a gray beard. So the me, me sometimes can't even grow a beard, sometimes has a dark beard, sometimes has a gray beard. So the color of the beard or whether there is a beard or not is clearly not essential to me, right? So that's this me idea. You know, the, the, the me that might have a beard or might not. The me that might have long hair or might not. The me that might da-da-da or not. So we're, what we're interested in and what this discourse is about is about that. The me. And now this question is about, okay, that me. 
does that me just go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever forever? Or does that me eventually kind of fall apart and eventually come to nihility, come to annihilation, come to nothingness? You know, just go out of existence entirely. What do you think? This is a very old debate. This was the hot, it was a hot debate at the time of the Buddha. And there were some people over here that believed that the real self, which by the way, this is what they call the Atman, right? The Atman is that idea of the real you, not the particular form of it, but the real you. That's that idea of the Atman. And the question is, does the Atman go on forever? Or does the Atman eventually peter out and go out of existence? And then at the time of the Buddha, there were some people that were said, no, 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 no. The real Atman goes on forever and ever and ever, is eternal. And therefore, if you can stop identifying with what with the particular, if you stop identifying with the changing and can identify with the Atman, then you're on this eternal cruise with Brahma in that sense. This is sort of one idea. This is, of course, not Buddhism, right? But the idea is, is that there were some people who believed that the self, the true self, just goes on forever and ever and ever. But there's another group of people at the time of the Buddha that were basically nihilists. They were like, nope, it's just a big, big chaotic swirl of elements. And the big chaotic swirl of elements gets together and makes what seems like a human being. And the human being kind of operates for a while, but then eventually whoop, goes out of existence entirely. So those were the options. And even though there are a lot of different versions of eternalism, and there were a lot of different versions of nihilism, the idea was is that it had to be one of those. And if you think about it, there's kind of not another option. Except there is in a way. And that's why the Buddha describes his teaching as a teaching that avoids the two extreme views. It doesn't fall into those extreme views where there's the belief that there is something that goes on forever or the belief that there is something that comes to nihility. And this, of course, is where you get the kind of the famous Buddhist declaration of anatman. There isn't an atman. And therefore, we don't need to talk about it going on forever or it going out of existence because it already doesn't exist. That's the idea of anatman. And that's sort of part of the middle path. We're going to get there when we talk about the 12 link chain of causation as it pertains to this. But that's the idea of the two extreme views. Now, what the Buddha said was, is that if you think about it that way, Kashapya, meaning you think about it that there's a performer of an action. And then the question is, later on down the road, maybe it's a minute, maybe it's 10 years. But the question is, is the, the being, so to speak, that receives the karmic result of that action. Is that the same person? Or is it actually two different people in that way? And the Buddha says, of course, well, if you assert that it's the same person, then you are asserting that there is a self, an Atman in that sense, that perdures. Like it endures, it stay, it stays from the performance of action to the receiving of the consequence of that action. There's a perdurance of self 
And what the Buddha says is, if there's a perdurance of self in there, that's eternalism. But then he says, but if you think that there's like one, conf like one person, and then later on down the road, it's a different person, which means that the first person is now gone. Well, that would then fall into the extreme view of annihilationism or nihilism. So the Buddha says, what I'm teaching is the Dharma by the middle that avoids those two extreme views. And then he mentions the 12 link chain of causation. And this is where he says, again, without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata teaches the Dharma by the middle with ignorance as a condition, volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. And so on and so on through the other links, which we will discuss in turn. But, he says, with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance, comes the cessation of volitional actions or volitional formations. And with the cessation of volitional formations, the cessation of consciousness, and thus the rest of the 12 link chain of causation. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. All right. And we'll save a little bit of time uh, after this to get into the end of the sutra. But so how is it that the 12 link chain of causation <laughs> is this middle path between the two extreme views of eternalism and annihilationism? And in particular, in regards to this conundrum about what's the relationship between the performer of an action and the that which receives the consequence of that action. So let's start actually with any kind of questions or ideas so far, just so I, if anybody's sort of like, I don't know, anything on anybody's mind about anything that's happening so far. Okay, so let's do this. Let's let's think about our 12 link chain of causation. If you don't know, I'm just trying to think how could I get you if you don't have it, I suggest kind of looking up the 12 links if you don't know them off the top of your head. But it would be kind of nice to have a reference for that. But this is a tricky idea. And it's very tricky in terms of like how exactly does this explain <laughs> this self idea in that sense. So the first thing that I want to do, because I might not get back to it, I want to actually just very quickly, simply explain sort of the what the Buddha said, like from a kind of straightforward point of view. And many of you might have already intuited what the answer is here. And what it is, is, is that so this question that Kashapya has, where he's like, okay, you got this performer of the action. And then down the road, you have the receiver of the consequence of that. And he wants to know the relationship between those two, as we've already said. Well, just to put it simply, and then we'll, we'll kind of reverse engineer this. To put it simply, what the Buddha, what the Dharma is, what the Buddha is saying, is that the initial premise that there's a performer of action that's already, we're already on the wrong foot. And so this question about the relationship then about the receiver of that action, it's kind of, it's a non-starter. We, we, there isn't that person already to begin with that's the performer of action. And there isn't even a receiver of karmic action in that way. So the relationship between them is is, it's a moot point if you're understanding it from the point of view of no self. Kashapya 
doesn't understand no self. He thinks there kind of is a self, but he's a smart guy. He's a smart kind of ascetic in that way. So he understands that, like, it would seem that he understands that there is a sort of um, what might be called flux or change. This idea, which is a kind of a Buddhist idea, of course, that there's sort of this ever morphing, ever evolving, ever changing state of being. And he's aware of that. So he's kind of interested in like, all right, so when there's the performer of an action, but later on down the road, the whole configuration has changed. Is that the same person or a different person? But he's thinking in terms of personhood rather than thinking in terms of what would be called or what is called dependent co-origination in that sense. So that's sort of just the quick version of this is that Kashapi is thinking in terms of the self. But if you look at it from the point of view of no self, there's no problem here. And it avoids the two extreme views. So, all right. So here's the thing about the 12 link chain of dependent origination. So you may know if you've seen it before or you've studied this before, you may know that these 12 links are sometimes presented as a wheel. And this wheel is called, often called the bhava chakra, the wheel of becoming, the wheel of bhava. And that's where you have sort of ignorance as a, as a, as a dharma, ignorance as a phenomena, which is the necessary condition for samskara. Conditioning is a way to translate it. Habits, habit energy, volitional formations, volitional actions. That samskara is the necessary condition for there to be consciousness. That's the third link. And then consciousness is the necessary condition for something called nama rupa, name and form. And you go around, and we're not going to go all the round, way around because I want to focus on the beginning of this, but you then eventually go all the way around these links until eventually you get to the phenomena of birth. And birth is the necessary condition for old age and death, old age and dying. And then if this is presented in a circle, old age and dying is the necessary condition for ignorance, which is the necessary condition for conditioning. And now we're right back doing it again. So that's the bhava chakra, the wheel of life. But this sutra rep, uh, um, references what is called the mass of suffering. And the mass of suffering is when you visualize the 12 links as like a pile. <laughs> and what that is, is, is that there's ignorance underneath at the bottom. And then stacked on top of that is our conditioning. And then on top of that is our consciousness and then language or nama rupa. And then from that, you get the six senses. And from the six senses, you get contact. Or, and then from contact, you get sensation, craving, clinging, bhava, birth and death, or birth and then death at the top. And that is this whole mass of dukkha this whole mass of suffering. Now, the reason to think about this in terms of a mass of suffering stacked like a giant kind of, you know, stack of pancakes in that way, the reason to think about it that way is because a sutra like this wants us to approach the very bottom of this, wants us to approach 
ignorance and understand that if we can pull out, if we can remove that, the whole mass of suffering ceases. Now, it is true that if you pull out any of these, any 12 of them, the whole mass of suffering ceases. But there's a particular emphasis on ignorance, not understanding. And the idea is, is that if, if one does understand, then that is not being ignorant. And if there is not ignorance, then there is not the necessary condition for samskara. So really quickly, let's also talk about, we, I, I want to also have this conversation about samskara. So the thing about Buddhism is, and this might kind of, I hope this might open up a lot of questions, so I hope it does. So there's this word samskara. And this is one of those Buddhist words that like dukkha, it gets translated all of these different ways. And one of the things to kind of keep in mind about samskara is that it has this really intimate relationship with karma. Karma meaning action. So something that I think often needs to be made clear. So Buddhism uses this term karma to refer to action, because that's what the word karma means, action, but action of the body, action of the voice, and action of the mind. So we can do things, say things, and think things. And all three of those are types of karma. Now, according to Buddhism, what it is, is that our karmic action is conditioned. And by the way, I haven't said this for a long time too. When the Buddhists are talking about conditioning, about being conditioned, they are talking about Pavlovian type of conditioning, the type of conditioning where, you know, Pavlov and his dogs, where he, he conditioned them to start salivating when they heard a bell because he coupled feeding them with ringing a bell. And so the natural phenomena of salivating, which the dogs were doing because there was food, this scientist guy, Pavlov, he tricked the dogs into salivating just when hearing the bell. And that's a form of conditioning. According to the Buddhist tradition, one of the aggregates of who you are like one of the conditional factors of what makes you, you is the way you're conditioned. What, what bells make you salivate in that sense? Now, I was using, I, I was using this example earlier today. I'm going to use it again. I want you to be thinking about conditioned behavior, conditioned actions. You can look at it like this. Let's say you're walking towards me on the street and all of a sudden I go like this. For you to go to to you for you to respond like that is a conditioned behavior. Or you might not respond with bodily karma you might respond with vocal karma. Hey, how's it going? So I go like this and you go, hey, how's it going? Or I go like this and you think I should go say hi to Michael. <laughs> He's waving to me. I should go, I should go say, I should go say hi. All three of those 
Whether you wave back, whether you talk back, or whether you think back, they are conditioned responses to the phenomena of this. And the basic idea is that all of our behavior is conditioned. Every single last breath, every last single thought, every last everything is conditioned in that way. And part of the disjointedness, part of the dukkha in terms of the disjointedness is thinking that it's free will when it's not. And that creates a kind of friction when our behaviors are actually conditioned, but we think it's just exercising free will. But then we find ourselves not being able to stop thoughts from arising. Ah, who's in charge now? So the idea is, is that the way our body responds, the way we, our voice responds, and the way we think, all conditioned. And by the way, thinking about language, thinking about speaking, we need to kind of understand that we are deeply conditioned in whatever language we speak. We don't actually have absolute freedom to just think whatever we want to think. We are limited with the words we have. So even though we think just expressing ourselves with our voice is like, that's about as free will as it gets, right? That's about as, that is about, that's about as much agency as it gets, right? Speaking, we need to recognize that we are not just speaking our own language mind. We are conditioned in English. We are given the English palette, the little, like it's like a palette of colors. We have a certain palette of words to work with. And actually within the confines of that, it's very structured. There's actually all, only so many avenues to go down. And in that way, it's all very conditioned. And if you can understand how it is that you are conditioned in language, you can start to notice the way you're very thinking is conditioned. That it's not just, uh, this is the way that I often like to put it. We tend to think of the brain as the generator of ideas, but in Buddhism, the brain is the perceiver of ideas, not the generator, the perceiver of them in that sense. Okay, so that's conditioning. Bodily conditioning, speech conditioning, and mental conditioning. All of that is samskara. And the idea is, is that conditioning, just like our Pavlovian dogs, it doesn't happen from just, well, I shouldn't say that. It can happen from just one exposure. But what I was going to get is what I was going to say is conditioning is usually through repeated exposures. So repeated exposures to a language, and then eventually you can just speak that language. So there's something about repeated exposures that then reinforces conditioning in that way. And this is where we want to notice that conditioning that we've just been talking about, it's dependent upon ignorance. And the point is, is that when we don't understand, we keep not understanding. And that reinforces the state of not understanding. And so we start to see the dependent relationship between ignorance and our conditioning. If you can understand the dependent relationship between not understanding what's going on and then continuing to repeat that and therefore reinforcing the ignorance, well, in the little feedback loop of ignorance and conditioning, 
as dependent conditions, there arises a state of consciousness. So we're up to the third link in the 12 link chain of causation. And by the way, what the Buddha is describing, what we're talking about now, we are describing the emergence of this sense of self. There isn't a self, but we are describing the emergence of that sense of self. This is the teaching of the middle that avoids the two extremes of their being a self that lives forever and ever and ever, or their being a self that is fated to die and is immortal. The teaching of the middle path is about how we are neither eternal nor, immor or nor fated to die in that way. Neither existent nor non-existent is what we talked about last weekend. Okay, so my point is, is that there is a emergent state of consciousness predicated upon the sort of biofeedback loop of ignorance and samskara. All right? Everybody with me so far? Cool. So Maria has an insight about free will necessitating a self. And that's kind of exactly the point, Maria, is that our idea about free will, it's like already based upon a certain idea. And that is exactly right, that when there isn't that, there isn't free will as we think about it. And this is answering a, a looming, it's a looming question that I, that's often present, which is when, when we hear about the Dharma, and we hear about conditioning, like especially in the extreme degree, as I just described it, where everything you do say and think is conditioned, there's sort of this idea about like, oh, so I don't, I don't have any agency. I don't have any free will then. And it's like, well, yeah, not if you're thinking in terms of self in which is conditioned in that way. And so just to kind of put a, an answer out there or to say something right now, I think the idea about free will, like we're talking about is a little misunderstood. And in the world of Buddhism, what we kind of have free will or agency around is suffering or not. That's actually where we have agency. And our, our exercise of a certain kind of agency is what is causing suffering, but then the exercise of another kind of agency is what gets us out of it. But it's tricky though, for a lot of different reasons, so. Okay, so shall we continue our examination of the dependent origination idea? Cool. So now that we have this understanding of ignorance giving rise to our Pavlovian conditioned behaviors, and that it is ultimately from that that there is then a state of consciousness, a state of consciousness is the necessary condition for what is called nama rupa. Now, nama rupa is one of the harder links in the 12 link chain of causation to kind of explain. The term nama rupa is a high, is a, it's a compound term. Nama can be translated as name. It's part of actually where we get the English word name from, is from the Sanskrit word namas. So nama and then rupa. Rupa means shape, form. Literally, it would be translated as form, but it means a shape. And so we could look at something like that. And the idea here is, is that this is a form, it's a shape. 
But what we want to notice is, is that there's a word, a name, a label, ball or round. And the idea here is, is that we would use that name or that label to describe this form in that way. But what Nama Rupa is, it's this very interesting thing that the Buddha seems to have like tapped into this very early on and Western philosophy would not think about this for many, 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 many centuries to come. And what it is, is it's about the role of language in conceiving of things. And the question is, could you conceive of something if you didn't have a word for it? And one of the examples that I've given, so I was, I was referring I was referring to this earlier, this, this gesture. And the idea here is, is that we have an English word and the English word is hello. And then we have like a Spanish word, hola. And then there's a Chinese word or words, Ni hao, or a Japanese word, konnichiwa, or a German word, or a French word, or this word, or that word. So there's all these different languages and all these different words for, for what? And you can't say for the word hello, because that's the English way of saying it. So what are we talking about that is called in English, hello, that is called in Spanish, hola, that is called in, in sign? What's the, what, are we, what, do, what do all of those refer to? And that's when we realize that we, we can't. We, did, we need a word. <laughs> and that's the actual idea of nama rupa. Is it's this really interesting relationship between words and their reference. Like the word and then what the word refers to in that way. So Nama Rupa is a really interesting aspect about what um, there was an Austrian philosopher from the early 20th century named Ludwig Wittgenstein, and he famously coined the expression, the language game. Nama Rupa is the way the Buddha described the language game. The language game is this kind of reflexive feedback loop of language in that way. So the Buddha figured that out about language and conceptualization. And the recognition is, is that if there is not a conscious mind there to play the language game, there's no language game being played. So no consciousness, no language game. Consciousness, language game. And then those two are resting, so to speak, on this back and forth between our ignorance and our conditioned behaviors. So now we've got the back and forth of our ignorance and conditioned behaviors, which give rise to a state of consciousness that plays the language game. And this is where it starts to get very interesting. The next up on the links, on the, on the chain of causation, is the six senses. And you could also uh, understand this as the six sensory pairs, by which we mean eyes and light, ears and sound, noses and scents, tongues and flavors, bodies and tactile sensations, and the mind and thoughts. 
So those are the six senses and their respective sensory objects. But guess what? I need the language game to conceive of those differentiations between sights and sounds and smells and flavors. And if I'm gonna start talking about salty versus sweet or bright versus dark or loud versus quiet, I'm gonna need the language game in order to do that. So we start to see a kind of dependent relationship between the language game and conceiving of experience in terms of sensory phenomena. Really quickly, very quickly, in order to understand what I just said, it's helpful to think about being in a dream. And the thing about it when we're dreaming, we see things, but our eyes are closed. We hear things, but not with our ears. We might even smell something in a dream, but we don't smell it with our nose. We might eat something and taste something, but we don't taste it with our mouth. We might go over to something and touch it in a dream, but we are not feeling it with our body. My point is, is that if you look at it the right way, a dream is a monolithic experience. And by monolithic, I mean it's mind. You know, it's just a conscious experience. But what I want you to notice is that the way that you're conditioned which is you're conditioned to divide experience into things seen versus things heard versus things smelt, tasted, and touched. And we preserve that state of conditioning in a dream where we interpret the dream experience as things being seen, even though there are no eyeballs to see it and there's no light to reflect off of anything, to bounce into anything. We preserve the idea of sounds, even though there's no ears and there's no reverberation of sounds or echoes or anything in a dream. But I want you to notice that you experience a dream as if you have eyes, as if you have ears. In fact, you experience a dream as if you're in it meaning as if you are you and there are things to be experienced. What I'm pointing at is what we call the subject-object relationship. And the subject-object relationship is a conditioned, a conditioned mode of thinking that we carry over into the dream state. And the moment the mind goes, what's that? There is the fabrication of the, of the seer, of the experiencer, but that experiencer or the seer arises upon the scene. They arise together in that dream state. Well, the 12 link chain of causation is suggesting that the same thing is actually going on here. And that is the ignorance that's underneath all of this which is the ignorance regarding the subject-object relationship. But that ignorant state is conditioned. We are conditioned to put this in terms of subject-object. And as soon as there is that ignorant state conditioned to do that, there is a consciousness, but it is a dualized consciousness. A dualized consciousness in terms of a consciousness that is thinking in terms of subject object. And guess what? That's the only way the language game works is if there's things to talk about. If I am everything in that sense, there, what's there to talk about? So ignorance, conditioning, the language game, or sorry, Ignorance, conditioning, consciousness, playing the language game, dividing experience into six kinds of sensory experience. 
And now that we've done that, there can be contact. And there can only be contact when there's a subject contacting an object. And what I want you to notice is, is that in a dream, there is what feels like coming into contact with other objects. And you have that experience of contact in a dream because you're under the delusion of having six senses. Why are you under that delusion? Because you're playing the language game with your conscious mind that's conditioned ignorantly. All right, everybody doing okay? I know I'm, I'm awesome, awesome, awesome. So now that we understand where contact is coming from, we understand that contact is the necessary condition for there to be vedana, for there to be sensation, or let's be really good Dharma students. Let's remember that vedana, what is translated as sensation, what it really implies is sensory reaction. Let's remember that when we talk about vedana, we're talking about having a positive reaction to what is being sensed or having a negative reaction to what is being sensed or possibly a neutral, just a totally neutral reaction to what is being sensed. But I wanna remind you that vedana is about the way that we react to things. And the way we react to things becomes conditioned in that sense. So once again, we are recognizing that we know where contact comes from now. You gotta have that subject object relationship, which is thinking in terms of senses and sensory organs. You gotta have that idea to have contact. But once you have contact, there can be a reaction to what has been contacted. That reaction to what has been contacted results in either a kind of leaning in and grabbing, which is this kind of craving, but if it's a negative reaction, I can crave to not have any more of it. <laughs> so when we get to the eighth link here, and the eighth link is about craving, tanha, the wanting. We want, we crave because of the way we have reacted to things. We've reacted in the kind of like, ooh, that's so great, give me more. Or we've reacted in the, that's terrible, make it stop. But I want you to notice that it's from that way of reacting that there arises this kind of craving for it either to keep going or the craving for it to stop. And now, from the craving comes the clinging, the upadana. Now, here's the thing about craving and clinging. And actually, here's the thing about sensation, craving, and clinging. So this is my little treasure chest. Do, do you want what's in here? Like, do you crave what's in here? You haven't had a sensation of what's in there. You haven't had a contact. And if you, you haven't had contact, so you haven't had a sensation, positive, negative, or neutral. And because you don't know whether you like it or don't like it, you don't have craving about it. And because you don't have craving, you don't have clinging. You're not like desperately like, give, give me, give me it, give me it. You don't have that craving or that clinging in that way. Again, because you haven't had contact in that sense. So we want to notice that subtle place no contact, no sensation. No sensation, no craving, no craving, no clinging. This is going to be all very helpful when we come around to this. 
Clinging is the necessary condition for bhava. And the word bhava, B-H-A-V-A, gets translated a lot of different ways. It means, it could mean life. It could mean existence. It could mean being, but it indicates the idea of something, some, something. What it is, that depends. But the idea that there is some thing, that's the idea of bhava, an, an existent, something, existing, something being. And what I want you to notice regarding there being something, you haven't had sensation, you haven't had contact, you don't know whether you want it or not, therefore there's no craving or clinging. What I want you to notice is there isn't anything yet. In your mind, there's nothing existing yet. Now, if I showed it to you, then there would be bhava, right? in that sense. But if I showed it to you, there would be contact and you'd have a sensation, which then would produce the clinging or the craving leading to the clinging. But what I want you to notice is the default mode understanding is the idea that there's something already there. And then I come into contact with it. But this is suggesting that the very idea of there being something there, no, 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 you don't get to have that until there's contact. And this is a subtle thing about dependent origination is the idea that the, that the thing arises with the contact. It's not there already. That's a subtle aspect of this teaching. But now, since we've gone all the way around, we, what we want to notice is, is that until there has been contact, until there's been sensation, until there's been the craving and the clinging, you don't have the thing yet. And what we want to notice is, is that if you don't have the thing, where is there room for birth? Where is there any room for the arising? The arising of what? No bhava, no arising. And if there's no arising, meaning no birth, there's no death. And that's the last link of the chain, the old age and dying. Now, in terms of objects, if we are talking about an object, we would not be talking about birth and death. We would be talking about creation and destruction. If we're talking about a creature or a being, we are talking about birth and death. But now, for the last little bit of this, we need to understand, we got to go all the way back and understand one important idea. This whole time, I've been using this example of either like what's in, what's in here, or the idea of seeing something or smelling something. <clears throat> and the idea here is we've been talking about objects, but what we're really talking about is the subject. What we're really talking about is the arising of the sense of self, the sense of subjectivity. And that sense of subjectivity comes from Ignorance giving rise to ignition state that gives rise to consciousness that plays the language game and so on and so forth. And all of that is then giving rise to the idea of bhava, which is the idea of me and it. But there's this idea that from the 12 link chain of causation sort of coming together there is the arising of the sense of subjectivity, just like in a dream. It's why I was using the dream as an analogy. There's the sense of subjectivity, but is there a subject? Is there an object? 
Or is that part of the illusion of the delusion of the dream state? So we're talking about where does the idea of the subject, of subjectivity come from? The bhava. Well, it comes from clinging, which comes from craving, which comes from all these other things. And the main thing that we really want to understand is that if, if we understand, oh, bhava, essence in that way, oh, that is something that is imputed, inferred projected it is not a real thing in that way the bhava meaning the ascent the self in that sense but it is arising from that clinging now the clinging by the way is what we call appropriation and it's about the appropriating mind the appropriating mind likes to go around and go my fingers my head my voice, my body. And then it'll go, those are your guys' bodies. So the appropriating mind likes to attribute ownership to things. It likes to go around saying, okay, you own that hair, you own that body, you guys, you own those glasses. This is my shirt. This is my body. So this appropriating is that clinging, is that clinging that is giving rise to the sense of the bhava, sense of the self being there. And when there is a sense of a self being there, well, it must have come from somewhere. That's called birth. It must be going somewhere. That's called death. And what we want to notice from this teaching is that when there is sense of self, there is birth and death. But when one understands that that essential bhava or that self doesn't have inherent existence, when we understand that it is kind of an emergent property, it's an, an, an emergent phenomena based upon this 12 link chain of causation, it's a provisional existence in that sense. When we understand that, the true nature of bhava, then there is nothing to have been born and nothing to die. And there is nobody in that sense performing karmic action, nor is there someone who is the recipient of the karmic consequences. Okay. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about all of that. Yeah, Maria. <laughs> Yay. Okay, there we go. Um, so this made me think of a, a friend of mine recently had a conversation with who has no sense of smell. And at first I was like, oh, dang, dude, that sucks because, <laughs> you know, there's so many beautiful smells. And then as you were talking, I was thinking about this and I was trying to describe something and he was like, means nothing to me. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. So name and form, there's no contact. And then I realized just a second ago, like, oh, I was feeling sorry for him, but actually he kind of has a leg up on me because he doesn't have, <laughs> the craving for the things that I love the scent mm. of and that I want to have like, I'll buy flowers because I want to smell flowers or whatever that creates this, that reinforces this sense of self and myself. Um, but anyways, he doesn't have to <laughs> contend with at least that one um, set of senses. Um, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's remember, you know, that there are creatures out there with antennas that we don't have, and they're out there sensing all kinds of other things that we don't get to sense. So from a Buddhist point of view, it's just different, not 
better or worse. But I hear what you're saying, though, Maria. Well, right. And then there's this idea of like, oh, is this just like other things that we're ignorant about that are happening all the time and that we're not hmm. picking up on for one reason or another? Um, I don't know. Yep. On, on that note, though, I will say that, you know, you know, there's this kind of really age old, um, I, I don't know what you would call it, uh, maybe a, a riddle, but it's a, the age old question of if a tree falls in the woods and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make any noise? And from a Buddhist point of view, it's actually about how it's about recognizing that if there's actually nobody there, there's no event. Like to talk about the tree falling in the woods, but then talking, but that there's nobody there is it's just words from a Buddhist point of view. But the reality is, is that there, that what is not experienced is not experienced in that way. And, you know, again, you could look at it that of, there is an infinite amount of things I'm not experiencing, but is it really helpful to even think about it that way? <laughs> There is, there is this, there is this in that sense. All right. So just, I will summarize very quickly. So at the end of this, when, when this was taught, when this sutra was taught, uh, the naked ascetic Kashapya said to the Buddha, magnificent. Magnificent, the Dharma has been made clear in many ways by the Blessed One, as though he were turning upright what had been turned upside down, revealing what has been hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or like holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. And then just to summarize, Kashapya goes to the Buddha for refuge. And he says, I'm, I'm giving up my naked ascetic ways, and I come to the Buddha for refuge. And then we hear the Buddha talk about this four-month probationary period, which was kind of customary at the time, where if you wanted to be part of the club, you had to give it a try for four months to make sure it fit. And we learn at the end of the sutra that, indeed, it fit, and Kashapya went on to even become an arahat an enlightened being. So, yay for Kashapya. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's going to be it for this Dharma Doors. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Hmm.